Hi, welcome to another Harbour Midweek Mini. Uh, this is the second part of three sessions uh, that I'm looking at some of the people who were near the cross when Jesus died. Uh, in the last session, I looked at some of the differences between the gospel accounts and identified some of the main characters who were present at the crucifixion. One group of followers, mainly women, were hiding in fear at the back of the crowd, um, while a small group were drawn closer to the cross. Today, I'm going to look at closer at this group, the group that was drawn closer. Let's start by reading John 19. Uh, verses 16 to 30 and again I'm using Holman version. They took Jesus away carrying his own cross he went out to what is called Skull Place which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign lettered and put on the cross the inscription said Jesus the Nazarene the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, I have written what I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took his cute tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. They did this to fulfil the scripture that says they divided my clothes among themselves. They cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And he said to his disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Last time I said that it was a meagre group of five that gathered at the foot of the cross, that they'd drawn, been drawn by love whilst others had been consumed by fear and were hiding at the back, or not even there at all. Well, being honest, there is some dispute actually about the number of people who were in this small group. We don't actually know if it was four or five. Um, apparently, it all depends on the placement of a comma. A comma. Now, my English isn't great, so I need an explanation. This is what an article from Christianity.com says about the whole use of punctuation in the New Testament or the Bible as a whole. It says this, the original languages in which the Bible was written didn't contain any punctuation. And yet, when translators convert a biblical text from ancient Hebrew to Greek or then into English, they faced the dilemma of how to insert punctuation properly into scripture. After all, the following sentences could be read very differently. And I'll try and get some this bit up on the screen. A statement very simply says, I'm going to work. Or, I'm going to work. Or, oh, I'm going to work. Mm. Or even, I'm going to work today? In this sen first sentence, the first sentence actually d contains what they call a declarative statement, a definite something. Statement very clearly, I'm simply going to work. 
don't believe it. I'll pause here and then I'll come back again. Now the interruption's over. Um, yes, anyway, the first sentence contains something certain I'm going to do. The second indicates the speaker is either very excited or emphatic about going to their job, hence the exclamation mark at the end of it. In our third instance, the speaker seems confused about whether they're going to work or not, it's a question. And the final sentence, we have a pause after, before the today. And I must admit, I've just now thought I missed out the todays in most of those other ones. You get the meaning anyway. This could indicate that they're emphatic about going to their job, or they want to focus on the today aspect of the phrase. I'm going to work. Today? Today. It just depends on the tone of voice, doesn't it? Anyway, in the passage I'm looking at, and this is John 19, 25-27, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, his wife, of the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And they said to the disciple, here is your mother, and from that hour the disciple took her into his home. Now, if we remove the punctuation from verse 25, we get at least two meanings. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, was his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Meaning one, there are four women present. Jesus' mother, Mary, an unnamed sister, because it's got commas either side of it. Another Mary, married to a guy called Clopas. And finally, a further Mary from Magdalene. Or we have meaning too. There are only three women present, and they're all called Mary. Even more confusing. There's Jesus' mother, Mary. There's Jesus' sister, Mary of Clopas. And there's also Mary Magdalene. And at this point, you're probably scratching your head and either thinking, so, or maybe even shouting at me, no, that makes no sense. Why would Jesus' mother, Jesus' mother Mary, have a sister also called Mary? That makes no sense, Mark. That is unless Mary Clopas is Mary's sister-in-law, that is Joseph's sister. During the period of this period of Jewish history, the in-laws were considered part of the blood family and referred to as brothers, sisters, as were even first cousins. I know this is a massive aside, <laughs> But the reason I took us there was just to show that we need to read the Bible with intelligence and allow the Holy Spirit to show us meanings that may not be clear on the surface on first reading. Now, let's get back on track. These three Marys, and I'm going to go with the second meaning because it simplifies things for me. These three Marys are important because they feature elsewhere in the Gospel. Obviously, you've got Jesus' mother, Mary. That's, that's, that's a given, isn't it? It's, it's obvious. Without here, there is no New Testament story. There's no beginning. She is central to the nativity and the childhood of Jesus. Matthew chapters 1 to 2. Luke chapters 1 to 2. But what about the other two Marys? Mary, wife of Clopas, is almost unanimously agreed to be the Mary also mentioned in Matthew 27, 55 to 56. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and ministered to him were there, looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. This Mary is also mentioned in Mark 15, 40 to 41. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, 
Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and also Salome. When he was in Galilee they would follow him and help him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem as well. By the way, Joseph is just another form of the name Joseph. So there is no difference between the Mary of James the younger and Joseph or Mary the mother of James and Joseph. Um, importantly here, Mary Clopas was a long-term follower of Jesus and had travelled with him from Galilee. She'd seen his miracles. She'd received his teaching. She'd seen his healings. She'd been with Jesus. With Mary Magdalene, things get even more interesting. But first, we almost have to forget, or at least some of us have to forget, um, something which has been attached to this faithful woman. The musical Jesus Christ Superstar portrays her as being an ex-prostitute and being romantically involved with Jesus. There is absolutely no biblical evidence for this whatsoever. The lie was popularised by Pope Gregory in 591 AD when he assumed that Mary Magdalene was the same Mary who anointed Jesus' feet with oil in Luke 8.2. This Mary was called a sinful woman. But there is no, no reason to make that connection other than the name. And we could just as easily have thought that this Mary was Jesus' mother. Um, so there's no real connection. Also, early Gnostic teaching from 200 to 400 AD portrayed Mary as a prostitute and bizarrely even claimed that she and Jesus had children together and there was this magical um, family that went through the ages who were the children of Jesus. Total and absolute rubbish. Let's try to reclaim her character. She did have a complicated past. Luke 8, 1-3 says this. Soon afterwards he was travelling from town to town and village to village, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, called Magdalene, whom seven demons had come out of, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, Susanna and many others who were supporting them from their own possessions. Big headline news. Mary Magdalene had been freed from seven demons. Mark confirms this in Mark 16.9. This is just after the resurrection. On the first day of the week after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. But beyond these two simple statements, we know nothing else about the story. We can get all fictional about it, but we know nothing. What we do know from Luke 8, 1 to 3, is that Jesus was with the 12 apostles. Sorry, Mary was with the 12 apostles and Jesus as they went from town to town preaching the good news and healing. That's in verses 1 to 2. We also know from verse 3 that she supported, she was part of the support, the financial support of Jesus and the apostles out of her own wealth. Now, all three Marys were specially attached to Jesus. Two of them, Mary Clopas, Mary Magdalene, travelled with Jesus. They heard all his teachings, saw all his miracles, all his healings. Mary, Jesus' mother, summed up an attitude that I believe they all shared. Luke 2, 19. Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. They were saturated with Jesus' teaching and presence. They couldn't even keep away at this last moment of him dying on the cross. And amazingly, as Jesus was dying, he poured out even more love on them. Let's go back to our John passage. John 19, 
26 to 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Amazing, isn't it? Jesus is dying in agony. And yet he can turn to this small group and love them and be concerned for them. And here we also finally meet another character in this last bit. The disciple he loved. Jesus loved all his disciples and followers. After all, not long ago, on the night that he was betrayed, he washed all of their feet, even Judas Iscariot's. But John let Jesus' love for him define him. He refers to himself as the one Jesus loved in John 13, 23 and also in 21, 7. And in both his gospel and the letters, they are just oozing with love. He's let love define him, the love of Jesus for him. And I guess in one sense, it um, makes him anonymous within his own gospel, because we can read us into ourselves, the one Jesus loved. I'm loved. Jesus loves me. The beloved. John, like the Marys, had become saturated with Jesus' love and couldn't stay at a distance as he died. They had to be, they'd been with Jesus for years. They'd witnessed and experienced his miracles and healings. They'd been soaked in his teaching. They had become saturated in his love. Now at the end of all things. They just had to be with their friend, their saviour, their Lord. Fear, regret, guilt couldn't keep them away. They were there to the bitter end. And of all the disciples and followers, this small group probably felt the biggest grief. Simeon, the old guy who prophesied over Jesus as a baby, said to Mary in Luke 2, 34-35, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. A sword will pierce your own soul. It's an apt description of how they all felt at the moment of Jesus' death. Now, we know that resurrection is coming. They hadn't experienced it yet. Grief ruled as far as they were concerned. But... In a short while, they would be the first people to know that Jesus had risen. And that's what we're going to look at in the final session. See you after Easter. <laughs>